Let us hear the first of our scripture lessons. It is um, uh, the, um, when Jesus reinstates Peter in John 21, 15 through 19. And if you want to read along, it is in page 108 in your pew Bible. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Will you pray with me? O holy God, fill this place with your spirit so profoundly that as we hear this word, that we can feel the truth in its wisdom. And let us leave this place so full of that wisdom and that spirit that we cannot help but share it with others. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second reading today comes from 1 John, chapter 4, various verses within it. Hear now a word from God for you today. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed to us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, We also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. But those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. 
for those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God who they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of God for the people of God. Legend tells us that long, long ago, a young, handsome man named Narcissus knelt every day beside a lake to contemplate his own beauty. One morning, as he leaned closer and closer to the water to get a better look at his own reflection, he fell into the lake and drowned. When Narcissus died, the nymphs of the forest appeared and found that the fresh water of the lake had been transformed into salty tears. Why do you weep? The wood nymphs asked the lake. I weep for Narcissus, the lake replied. Ah, that makes sense, they said, for you were the only one who could see his beauty so closely. Was Narcissus beautiful? The lake asked. The nymphs were, the, were surprised. Didn't you see, they said. After all, it was by your banks that he knelt every day to see his reflection. The lake was silent. Finally, it said, I weep for Narcissus. I never noticed he was beautiful. I weep because each time he knelt beside my banks, I could see in the depths of his eyes my own beauty reflected. There's something about this ancient tale that feels just as true and just as relevant now as it must have felt way back then. If you remember, former President Barack Obama first gained national fame in 2004 when he gave a speech at the Democratic National Convention. And he spoke of common American values that he had hoped would unite the country. He said, now, even as we speak, there are those who are preparing to divide us. The spin masters and the negative ad peddlers who embrace the politics of anything goes. Well, I say to them, there's not a liberal America and a conservative America. There's the United States of America. There's not a black America and a white America and a Latino America and Asian America. There's a United States of America. Yet years later, in his final State of the Union address, as he addressed a nation that was now even more divided than ever in the midst of the 2016 election, President Obama said, it's one of my greatest regrets of my presidency that the rancor and suspicion between the parties has gotten worse instead of better. Friends, it is an admittedly scary thing for a pastor to even mention President Obama's name from the pulpit. And I can feel some of you bristling with anger already. Scarier still, I could mention President Trump's name. And oh, I think the other half is starting to get all riled up. I think I have successfully angered everyone, and it may be a good thing that today is my last Sunday with you all. <laughs> but in all seriousness, do you see it? We look upon a world that is perhaps more self-obsessed than ever before. A world of selfies 
and selfishness, a world in pain as the barriers of hatred and division rise between us, a world so divided that we surround ourselves only with people who look like us, live like us, think like us, believe like us. They say that this sense that we feel that America is more divided than it used to be is actually backed by hard data. We see it in our politics. No longer can we agree to disagree. No longer can we work together to find common ground. Instead, according to recent polls, many Americans think that the people of the other party are, quote, ignorant, spiteful, evil, and generally trying to destroy the country. We are convinced that the other side isn't just wrong. They are dumb and they are evil. We see it in our homes. There's something called the Trump divorce. Have you heard of this? One study entitled The Trump Effect on American Relationships reported that over a quarter of all married Americans acknowledged that the current political climate was causing tension with their partner. We see it on our news feeds, for those of you on Facebook, and the news we watch. Experts say that the polarization and distrust have been intensified by the internet which is so full of misinformation and it funnels people into echo chambers and provides a safely anonymous place behind the keyboard to espouse hate speech for everyone else. And sadly, friends, we see it in our churches. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, it is appalling that the most segregated hour of America is at 11 o'clock, 9.30, on Sunday morning. Tragically, that statistic is not very different today. Our scripture passage this morning doesn't pull any punches and it doesn't mince any words. Those who say, I love God, but hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters. Ouch! That is harsh. The reason it gives for this harsh, con harsh condemnation is simple. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. For God is love. Going back, what if there are actually two ways to read our legend? The alchemist and Paulo Coelho's beautiful novel picks up a book that someone has left behind, leafs through its pages, and finds this legend of Narcissus. And yet when he reaches the end, and he shuts its pages. The alchemist doesn't condemn the lake or even Narcissus for their self-centeredness. Instead, the alchemist closes the book and says with simple satisfaction, what a lovely story. He then teaches his protege, the shepherd boy, a more beautiful lesson. When we love, he says, we always strive to become better than we are. And when we strive to become better than we are, everything 
around us becomes better too. What if, my friends, what if Narcissus did not go to the lake each day merely to admire his own beauty? What if instead Narcissus looked deeply into the lake, still fresh water each day, in hopes that he could reflect its own beauty back to it? What if in him and through him, Narcissus had shown the lake a more beautiful vision of what it could be? What if in him the lake was able to see the reflection of God? When we love, we always strive to become better than we are. And when we strive to become better than we are, everything around us becomes better too. Friends, in every single encounter with every person you meet, whether here or on, news, on your news feed on Facebook, you have two simple choices. In their reflection, either you can see all those differences that divide you, all of those ways that they don't look like you, live like you, think like you, or believe like you, or instead, you can dare to see the reflection of God. These are your two choices in every single encounter with every single person, whether here or on your newsfeed. Friends, this is my last Sunday with you. You are gonna be in very, very, very good hands. But as my last Sunday with you, as you have come to know and, and fear, I would like you to do a little experiment this is the last Sunday I get to do it, so I got to take full advantage. I want you to either look to your left or to your right or front or back, whatever is easiest. And really look. I don't see anyone looking. Look, 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 look. <laughs> Friends, this, this is your sister. This is your brother. And if you're married, that got really weird and I'm sorry. <laughs> do you see them? I mean, do you really see them? If you aren't, look now and see. This person beside you may be a Republican, or they may be a Democrat, or something else. They may be black, or white, or Latino, or Asian, or something else. They may be a millennial, or a baby boomer, or some generation that doesn't have a name. They may be sure of their faith, or right now, they might be riddled with doubts. They may be so similar to you, or oh, so different. But no matter what, this brother or sister is a uniquely and wonderfully made, beautiful child of God. Look again. Do you see God? Thank you, and if you haven't already, you can stop staring. I don't know, I don't know if you remember that sermon before, but anything longer than five seconds gets weird, so feel free to stop. This is my final challenge for you today, my brothers and sisters. I dare you to look for the beauty that's beyond your own reflection. It sounds so simple, but this may be the most countercultural, world-altering, life-shaping gifts 
that you can offer to another person when all of the forces of this world are threatening to divide us. When the forces of the world threaten to divide the people of this congregation or this community with all of its barriers of hatred and division, I dare you and I dare this church to look for the reflection of God. For God is love. Amen.